I'll have a good time this afternoon. I've actually got three separate little presentations. Now, the, the first one uh, came, I guess, as a, uh, a direct invitation around a follow-up to our variable speed uh, bearing work. And I guess what we're talking about here is traditionally a lot of the monitoring of bearings with ultrasound has been around fixed speed bearings. And, and obviously these days, more and more now, especially with motors over four kilowatt, you're seeing an industry, just about every motor seems to be installed fitted with a VSD. Okay, and so what you're seeing now is whereas before you could monitor a bearing um, at a fixed speed, more and more now those bearings aren't running at the same speed. So there's complications around how you can monitor those. So what we're going to talk about today, I'll start with a little bit of a brief introduction for those of you that aren't familiar with where I'm from. It's a little uh, um, map in New Zealand. There's Hamilton right there, heart of the, uh, the North Island. Um, a few little interesting stats for you. Within an hour and a half's drive of where we are in Hamilton, um, over 40% of New Zealand's energy is both generated and used. Okay, so we're the, the heart of uh, the, uh, the industrial backbone of New Zealand. Um, Fonterra, um, New Zealand's biggest company, they're responsible for nearly one in three um, export revenue dollars for the entire economy. If you take out the growth in dairy exports from New Zealand in the last 15 years, New Zealand's economy has been going progressively backwards. For those of you who might be wondering, you've heard about the earthquake in Christchurch. That's Christchurch down there. Um, unfortunately, to say yes, it was pretty uh, badly hit. 1,360 buildings demolished inside the CBD in Christchurch. Okay, But I'm happy to report a year on from that earthquake, 90% of businesses within that CBD are still in business today. Okay, so enough about Hamilton. Um, I run the Energy Research Centre or the Industrial Energy Efficiency side of our research centre at the university. That's kind of the view we have from our office. It's not bad. I like where I work. Um, a whole heap of stuff up there and what we do. Basically, if it's anything to do with energy used in industry, uh, we've, we're doing something there. We also have a role with uh, oil and gas and also renewable energy. Okay, we do a lot of numerical modeling, economic modeling, a lot of experimental work, but one thing that we pride ourselves on is we do a lot of work out in industry, in plants, taking real measurements and, uh, and bringing about change. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna have a quick review to start off with on variable bearings, okay, and establishing alarm levels. Okay, then we're gonna talk about how we actually implement it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a little bit of a quick review, and then I'm gonna go through step by step how you can set up a monitoring program and a lubrication program for your variable speed bearings, step by step, so you can take this away with you. Okay, so first of all, key questions. With a variable speed, application. Now just show our hands, who has a variable speed system running somewhere in their plant or facility or something that you're responsible for? Okay, how do you monitor it right now? Who had your hand up? How do you, how do you monitor the condition right now? Vibration. Vibration, and how's that work for you, all right? Okay, okay. But our, our slope, our variable frequency drives, most of the pumps run about half speed most of the time. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? And okay, and, and how do you compensate for the variation in speed with your with your monitoring? We usually base load it. This is the only way we can figure this out. You know, what that pump normally would run at roughly, usually on the, our condensate pumps, for instance, running at about fifty percent normally. Okay. On average, so that's what we will baseline and put it in that and, and base load it to that. Okay, it's nice to have the luxury to do that. Most of the plants we deal with, they don't have that flexibility. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, how we can do this without messing with our production. So what we've got is there's a few test variables. There's speed, test frequency, and then the big question of well, what, how do we set our alarm levels? Okay, so let's get straight into it. First of all, just a very quick review. Some of you have seen this in a presentation a couple of years ago. This is just a quick refresher. Okay couple of pumps, so you can see the top two curves that are overlapped are the, uh, the motor and then you've got the pump underneath. You'll see that over the speed range, okay, you've got somewhere around sort of 5 to 6 dB variation. Okay, but as, as you sort of mentioned yourself, 
Generally speaking, with your variable speed applications, they normally run in a fairly narrow band. Okay, but what we're talking about is your variation in dB, regardless of load, is only going to be a few dB. Okay? Now, the advantage of that means is if we can be a little clever with our baselines, we can treat these as a regular bearing through DMS. Okay, and then I'll talk about a few extra strategies you can employ to make that work. Here's a pulp screen. Now you'll see what, something interesting here, the top two curves, the motor's fairly steady. Um, ignore the dB scales, those need to be reset, my apologies. But uh, you can see the, the, uh, the actual, uh, the, uh, the screen itself had quite a large variation. And that's as much to do with the material going through the unit itself. And so in certain applications, you need to be a little mindful of what it is you're dealing with. And we'll come back to that. Another one here, just a, a motor and a, uh, a pump on a flume. Very flat. Okay. And then here we go again. A, uh, just a, a fan going through an air heater. Very flat again. Okay, so here's the rub. Variation in speed had very little impact on the dB level variation on the motor. Okay. So the upshot of that is, is we can just treat those as a regular bearing just in our DMS. We don't need to worry about trying to base load the unit or anything else. You're going to get an adequate um, outcome. Okay. Now, what happens, of course, is when you get into the specific, our um, application specific <laughs> options, you need to be a little careful. And so this is where it comes down to understanding your equipment. And so instead of when you're doing your baseline in, in, your, in your DMS, you've got to think about, well, what is my baseline? Okay, so your baseline is actually going to be a function of speed. Okay, now for some of you, who thinks that sounds a little complicated? Yeah, a little complicated? Okay. Um, well, we're going to come back to how we can potentially get around that too. Okay, but um, what you have to bear in mind is we're going to jump ahead a little, okay, and talk about how you can actually manage that by just thinking about the actual process and procedure, okay? Now, before we do that, just as a quick reminder, I haven't thrown these graphs in because I didn't want to waste too much time on this today. If anyone wants them, we can go and dig them up. But remember that you get some very interesting effects as you change your test frequency on the ultra probe, okay? What happens with your VSD, remembering someone mentioned the other day about the, uh, the modulation frequency of the VSD or VFD, can vary anywhere from, say, 4 kilohertz up to perhaps 16 kilohertz. What happens, of course, is you can get the harmonic of that sampling frequency or the, or the modulation frequency can interact. So you've got to be careful that you very carefully select your test frequency on the gun so that you're not lining it up with the resonance. Because what happens is in certain situations you'll do, if this is dB and this is speed, you might like have a curve like that for most test frequencies and then all of a sudden at a certain test frequency you'll have a, so I'm sorry if we um, forget about speed for a minute and just talk about frequency, you'll get a certain test frequency that happens to be a harmonic of your, the, the modulation frequency of the VSD, and it'll throw the results out of whack. Okay, and obviously when you couple that with whatever the unit's doing with speed, everything else. So you need to be prepared to recognize, I'm not recommending you change the modulation frequency of the VSD, okay, because that, that could be set for other reasons, okay. But it's simply a matter of saying, hey, we don't have to use a set frequency for every bearing. Now, just as a quick, quick pop quiz, what frequency are we doing this at with our gun? We've got our ultra probe, we're doing this testing, what frequency are we using? 30 kilohertz, okay, do we have to use 30 kilohertz? No. Have, yes, no? No, okay. So what other frequencies can we use? 
We're going to use 100 kilohertz. The unit will go to 100. Why aren't we going to go to 100? Gary doesn't like 100, so that's why we don't use 100. Is that right? That's the correct answer. Why, why is it the correct answer? Because Gary Moore said so? Yes. 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 Surely you got, if, if Gary said don't, you know, go jump off the cliff. Gary said so, you're going to jump off the cliff? Yes. <laughs> no. This is what happens when you feed people free booze, huh? They just do exactly what they're told, like lambs to the slaughter, huh? Yes. Oh, okay, I'll accept that one, all right? Got a family to feed, huh? So what happens when you make a commitment and get married, uh, Sean, you know? That's right. Okay, no, well, well 100 kilohertz, we're not going to get anything useful, right? Okay, what happens as we increase our frequency? Fundamentally, what happens? The signal attenuates more quickly, more slowly? More quickly. So you, you're just not going to get any useful information. So keeping that principle in mind, if we're at 30 kilohertz and we've got a problem, which way are we going to go? Up or down? Down. Down. Because we want to go lower rather than higher. Because lower we're going to get potentially better resolution. The higher we go, the less we're going to get. The higher the frequency, the more attenuation. Okay, so we're looking for a good signal here. Now, occasionally, if you've got a lot of background noise, okay, what might you do? Go higher. Why? Higher frequency? Yeah? So the noise from the pump or whatever else is making noise downstream is going to be attenuated. Okay? So it's always good to remember. Remember that theory that you did on day one and the level one? You know, there's a reason they go through that. Because when you come across these situations, you need to stop and think for just a second and say, hey, what is the gun telling me? How does the gun work? And how can I use that for my advantage? Okay? Am I making any sense? Yeah? Okay. Does anyone want to disagree? I mean, feel free. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't sign your check. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, okay, no, we covered all of that. All right, so establishing our alarm levels. First question, how critical is my piece of equipment? Why is that number one? It's, it's your money maker? Yeah, okay, I'll accept that. Okay, okay, so we decide that something's critical. What's that going to do to how we set the alarm level? Okay, what's our default alarm level? Eight and 16 dB, right? Okay, so if we've done our test and unknowingly it's running a little faster, what's going to be, what's going to happen to the dB? It's going to go up a little, right? Okay, so potentially we're going to have a false positive result in terms of hitting a, a lubrication alarm or a failure alarm, correct? Okay, but if your kit's critical, you're going to prefer that to missing something, right? Now, if the piece of kit's not so critical, what are you going to do? You don't want to be lubricating everything, okay? Especially if you've got a bigger band of dB that that, that that piece of kit operates over, depending on the speed, okay? Now, the other thing you should be able to do if you don't want to go to actually measuring speed, okay, you should be able to recognize what's my baseline speed, what's my speed actually today. Now, whether that's carrying a strobe so you can get the speed, or wandering over to the VSD and just checking where it's at, or maybe checking with the guy in the control room, the operator, and saying, well, where are we at today? We flat out, or we, you know, back a bit? You know, understanding where you're at when you start. Okay. So occasionally, what you might want to think about doing is increasing that alarm level. So instead of going 8, 16, you know, maybe I'm going to go 10, 20, or if it's something like the pulp screen, you might say, well, is that critical, isn't it? 
you might say, well, actually, when I stop and think about it, if it's 12 dB, it's either going to be one or two things, just a little high because it's going too fast or faster than my baseline, or it means I'm a little bit past my lubrication alarm. What's your action going to be at that point anyway? Can you do anything else other than lube it? So does it really matter? Okay. Well, is, are we going to do anything else other than that? Trend. Okay, what do you mean? Let, let's elaborate on that. What, trend what? Your DB, your, your readings. Okay. Over a bit, I have a okay, yeah, we're going to trend that. Is there anything else we can do? No, nope, forget the alarm level. We'll pass that. We've got a problem. Yeah, spectra, total quality. Okay, before spectra, fundamental. I think I can't, I do apologize. I can't remember who said it the other day. What's the number one asset you've got at your disposal? Okay, your brain. Hopefully your brain. What's your brain connected to? Your ears. Okay, how can we use our ears? We're, we're listening to that bearing, right? If the bearing's good, but just an elevated level because it's running faster, what's it going to sound like? It's going to be that same white noise, just at an elevated dB, right? So you're thinking, well, the bearing seems okay. So you're going to think, well, hey, it's a little bit high. We may need to add it to our lubrication list, but we're not going to get too alarmed, right? But to be on the safe side, if we've managed to convince our boss to spring for a 10 or a 15, what else can we do? Record the sound, okay? And if you're fortunate enough to have the 15, you could bring up the spectralizer there and then on the spot, okay? Otherwise, you go back to the office. But the point is, okay, we can then use spectralizer to confirm what's going on, okay? So first port of calls our ears. Second port of calls recording the sound file, okay? But ultimately, our, our actions are just up here, right? So we've got our dB level, we've got our motor speed, and we've got our sand files. Now from a data analysis point of view, we've only got a few options, right? It's either going to be good, it's going to be bad, or it's going to be in no man's land of the amber light where everyone's thinking, do I go through the lights or do I not, right? Who's ever had someone in a car in front of them do that? You can't quite tell whether they're going to commit or whether they're just going to slam on the brakes. Okay, sort of that, that no man's land. Okay, well, what does that mean for us in this situation? Okay, what do we do? It's going to go on a watch list, right? Instead of hitting that thing every, every couple of months or every month, you might say, hey, well, I'm going to check that next week. Okay, all right, well, if we've got a lubrication alarm, okay, there's a couple of outcomes here. Fairly simply, now for those of you madly writing anything down, um, at the end of this I'll give out my card and you send me an email and you can get a complete copy of this. Okay, the test results either going to be true and that's good, okay, or it could be bad and that bad might be true or false. Okay, back to using our ears, check the sound file, and our action's pretty simple. Either we're going to add it to the lube route or we're not. What else can we do? Now, if, it, if it's, I'll get to the early onset of failure in a minute, okay? Now, the key point here is, so this is added to our lubrication list. So we go out and lube that thing, what are we going to do? Are we just going to go up there and, and squeeze that grease in that, that thing? Who said yes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be docking his pay, Gary, all right? Did you, did you make a note of who said that? Okay, good. All right. So the beauty of it is whether you're using the grease caddy or the gun, when you go out and lube that thing, that's your, your final check. And a couple of things are going to happen here. You start pumping the grease in. If the DB doesn't go down, what do you do? All right? The... <laughs> keep pumping, right? Yeah? All right. You've got to keep pumping till they, till they start going down, right? Yeah, till, till the seals pop off and, 
And then you think, well, hey, now there's no seal, I better give it some more grease, right? <laughs> okay, in all seriousness, okay, if the dBs don't go down, you stop. If the dBs go down, what do you do? Give it some more grease. DB stop, what do you do? You stop, right? Pretty simple. We don't have to get very complicated, do we? You know, do we have to have a complicated DMS with all these extra curves depending on what speed we're running at and anything else? It's just all about saying, hey, we might need to have a quiet word to our man that's going out on the loop route, but that's about it, right? So, hey, you need to take special attention when you go and look at these bearings. Okay, but apart from that, it's easy. The key point is you've got to have the right gear. So this is something where you really need to have the 10,000 or the 15,000. And if you can't afford either of those, it means you're not going to be able to um, analyze the sounds. You're just going to have to rely on your ear. So if you've only got the nine, what do you need to have especially? Good set of ears and either a grease caddy or your, or your lube guy's going to go out with the gun. Okay? And he's going to need the holster because you can't hold the gun and, you know, I mean, you've got to think about it. But it's back to having the right gear to do, do the job properly. Okay, let's talk now for a minute about... I've got a point that we struggle with quite a bit. Yep. And that's, we work with a lot of grain elevators. Grain elevators, grain elevators yes. And Instead of variable speed drives, it's loading and unloading of conveyors and belts, and it has exactly the same characteristics of a variable speed drive, depending on so the your, your load's load changing. Yeah, the, the, the load's changing. So to bring up, you know, your loading and unloading of uh, unloading of the, the condensate pump. Yeah, you have to establish different criteria for the load that they have that day, whether it's running empty just to get the test or fully loaded carrying the weight of the grain that they happen to be moving. So yeah. You could apply the same principles the same way. You can just stick to your baseline, rely on your ears, rely on the sound file, and, and back out. You go back out with the grease caddy, and if you're prepared to accept, hey, I might have an extra couple of points added to my lube brute, okay, but provided he's got his grease caddy or his gun with him as he's out there with the gun, perfect, problem solved. Yeah. Or when you go out that way, if they're running it, you've got to almost have a whole set of criteria for loaded, unloaded, partially loaded. You need to know each one because they'll test totally different just based on the load that they've got yeah. What I'd, 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 I'd like to suggest that if you apply these simple principles, you can get around a lot of that hassle. Sure. And that changes the dB sometimes from, I heard them as low as 16 dB all the way up to 60 dB. Uh -huh. And it's just the same exact test. So you've got to really watch when you're taking oh, your notes. Absolutely. But the point is this. I mean, to me, I'd use that as a great way of justifying, hey, boss, I need a 15,000 because I can do all of this on the spot. I'll be here all week. <laughs> okay, so if you come back to the, okay, so we think we've got an early onset of failure. What are we going to do about it? What's our options? Here and now, we, we know we, we, or we think we've got an early onset of failure. How do we confirm that? Well, we don't even need to go to biration yet. What's the first thing we can do? Okay. Listen. Record the sound file. We're going to be able to confirm whether that's the case or not, right? Or whether it's just a raised dB. Maybe the grain's extra wet and so the load's even higher today because, you know, the grain was wet when it came in. Okay. So it's, it's all about thinking, well, what have I got at my disposal to be able to confirm, validate, verify what I think or what I'm assuming is happening. Okay, best in, oh, there we go, sorry. Best indications, what we hear. Now our action is actually no different. We're going to go back out, lubricate where we can, and then the other thing is, who mentioned maybe uh, 
monitor a bit more frequently, put it on our watch list, okay? That's all there is to it. So, if there's any questions, I'll happily take them on this particular topic. This is the first of three. I'm not going to risk letting you out the door because we don't have much time this afternoon. Any questions on this one? There's two things that affect the wear of, of bearings. One is speed, and the other is the load. Yes. All right. If we have a, a, a charge line, the load is pretty much even throughout the conveyor. Mm -hmm. And the other variable would be the speed. Mm -hmm. How much speed are we talking about to make a difference, a difference in our, our decimal readings from our baseline? Um, varies, varies on the piece of kit, which is why you have to be a little careful. Um, but generally what you'll find is, with the exception of a few obvious examples, your speed doesn't actually vary that much in most instances. And even with the speed, what we've found is your motor bearings, the DBs don't change very much at all. Because you bear in mind that your load on your motor, the bearings on your motor, if your motor's set up correctly, are carrying next to no load, right? I mean, if, if your motor's all balanced and everything else, in theory, you should actually be able to take the bearings away and the magnetic field in the motor should have that, that rotor just spinning. Okay, so your bearings on your motor should have very little variation, okay, the, regardless of what speed they're at. The only thing you've really got to be careful of is whatever that motor is then driving. Okay. If it's a pump, obviously as that speed's going up, you're putting more, more flow, more head, you know, same with a fan, and so you have to be a little careful. Okay. Um, and granted more load, you've got more load on the bearing, okay, so you need to be careful. But the point is this, above all else, with the sensitivity dial on the gun, you can use your ears as, as a pretty good judgment of, of, as the first warning Okay, the dB level is just a secondary thing in terms of uh, a lubrication alarm. And this is where it comes back to, if you're prepared to accept you might have a few extra false positives, then you're just going back on a lube route and you may not actually add any lube or maybe a tiny bit at all. Because bearing in mind, if you think about your, your standard dB trend for a bearing, there's your first alarm level and then your, your baseline's here. This thing might trend along, and it's only once that gets through that alarm level you're going to go and lubricate it, right? It doesn't mean that you couldn't have gone and lubricated it here, right? And brought it back down. Okay, and so with the false positive, all you're going to do potentially is instead of waiting to this point, you're actually lubricating a little early. But lubricating a little early means with the grease caddy or the gun as you lubricate, you're going to add less grease. Now, just as a brief little anecdote, we're working with a dairy company in New Zealand, not Fonterra, one of the independents. They um, started a program three months ago, and I caught up with the, uh, the guys at a conference in New Zealand last week. And they've been measuring it, and I'm happy to report since applying this program in their plant, they've actually tracked and reported their results. No failures at all with their bearings whatsoever. And most important of all, over a 90% reduction in their use of lubricants. 90%. Excuse me, but when I see a reduction in my lubricants, I'm really wondering if they're doing their job of lubricating. Absolutely, they're, they're, they're doing a monthly, they were actually still doing a monthly lubrication. They're, they're actually working on getting a, they didn't even have a 10,000 or anything. They've, they've got an Ultra Probe 100 and a Grease Caddy. Okay, and they're already there. They're actually looking at getting even better than that. Because they're down just doing this with the Grease Caddy, lubricating every month to condition not actually waiting to hit that alarm level at the moment. That works. And, and they've got every single motor in their factory. In the, in the dairy plants in New Zealand, any motor over four kilowatts is fitted with a VSD. 
and, and the plants ramp up and down all over the place, left, right and centre all day long. And yet they can still do this. It works. You know, it's, it's just back to those basic first principles of I'm only going to add enough lubricant till the dB stop dropping. Okay? It really is that simple. What, I mean, this is our problem. As engineers, we always overcook things, don't we? We, we, we? We're looking to make things more complicated than they need to be. It's our biggest fault as engineers, is it not? I love the, the, the KISS principle. Do you have that expression over here? Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. Have I answered your question? Yeah. And I said, said, what is the KISS principle? And I said, keep it simple. And go away. And he wants to be later on and ask me about what is the other end. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, thanks very much, Dave. What I'm going to do next is there's been quite a lot of questions over the years um, about variable speed drives and, and the problems associated with them and some challenges and all the rest of it. So I thought I'd take a few moments today to, I guess, go over sort of VSDs 101, so sort of an entry level sort of brief overview. It's, it's nice to understand a few of these basic principles. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit for a moment about the function of a VSD or, or who, who understands what I'm meaning when I say VSD? So there's a few of you that are looking at me and, and, and are not understanding. What if I said VFD? Okay. VFD variable frequency drive, VSD variable speed drive, exactly the same thing. How do you get a variable speed drive? By varying the frequency, right? One and the same. My apologies for my uh, southern uh, uh, terminology. I'm going to talk a little about other alternatives. I'm going to talk about a few applications. Um, and a little bit on the importance of demand profiling and, and, and correctly sizing these things. I've, this is one of a, the pet, pet hates of mine, I guess. There's a lot of people out there that think a VSD is, is the, the one-stop fix-it. You know, you're not sure what, how big, well, we just put a VSD on that thing and it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll just, the VSD will take care of it. Okay, that's not the way to do it, and I'll, and I'll share a few stories on that. The basic function of a VSD... What I'm going to do for a minute is I'm going to use the, uh, the, the little scratch pad here for a second. Coming in, we have three phase power, okay? And over here you have it at, what, 60 hertz? Okay, so I, three phase power, 60 hertz, okay? Does anyone know what the VSD does to that, that power? No. Excellent. So what it's doing is it's putting it through an SCR block, silicon-controlled rectifier. Okay, and what it's effectively doing is it's turning that... where you've got a positive and a negative, which effectively becomes, okay, except what that ends up being, it has a ripple on it. Now, does, is there anyone out there that's a little lost how I go from here to here? Okay, that's all good, because remember, I've just drawn one phase, right? But remembering that you've then got and we'll use red. You got your three phases and they're each 120 degrees out of phase. No, 120. So if you think about it, on a circle, 
If you've got one here, so if that's phase one, that's phase two, 120 degrees out of phase, then round here at 240 degrees, you've got your third phase. Okay, and as that rotates round, they're all rotating and they're consistently 120 degrees out of phase from phase to phase. And so at any one time, because see what happens is you've got three separate lines coming in. Phase one, two, three. But over here, you've just simply got a positive and a negative. Okay, does that make sense? Because each of these phases is being switched and the positive side of the wave is being sent this way. The negative size of the phase is being sent that way. And each of the phases are being sent, split up like that. That's how the rectifiers work. And so it's either being directed to a positive bus bar or a negative bus bar. Okay, but because you don't get a square wave by competing three sine waves, you get this ripple on it. Okay, now that ripple is improved a little by having a whole heap of capacitors in the drive. Okay, now if I jump over the page here, so you've now got positive and negative, and remembering it's still kind of like this, how do they then convert that back into an AC waveform? Does anyone know? Don't be shy. I know someone mentioned these by name the other day in their talk. No, no, the rectifiers are on the front. Okay. The, the back end is through transistors or what they called IGBTs. Insulated gate bipolar transistors. Okay, that's a cool, cool, cool term you can throw out when you go back to work and sound, hey boss, I got educated last week, it was worth the investment. Okay, I learnt what an IGBT is. Okay, basically all it's doing is switching these on and off. Okay, but these are switching at what they call the, the modulation frequency. It was the frequency I talked about a few minutes ago. And remember what, does anyone remember the frequency I said? Sixteen what? Sorry? Sixty? No. No. Remember I said it was between four and sixteen kilohertz. Remember I talked about it being a harmonic of that modulating frequency which was potentially interfering with our, our 30 kilohertz or our 28 kilohertz or our 24 kilohertz with our sampling frequency? Okay, it's very high frequency, not quite in the ultrasound spectra but not far off. Okay, does anyone know why they use such a high frequency? If all you've got is positive 578 volts and minus 570 volts, how do we generate a smooth sine curve or sine wave? The faster you switch, okay? And so what you end up with okay? And so the noise on here is basically at the frequency of our modulation frequency. Okay, and this is actually really important because this is the root of quite a few problems that I'm going to talk about for a minute today. And it's very useful to understand some of this. See, what happens is that becomes quite a messy curve, right? Because you can't make a nice smooth curve. Because bear in mind that we might want this to be at 30 hertz. Because if we're at 50%, how do we get to 50% speed? You've got to half the frequency. Yeah? Yeah? 
okay? And if we want to speed that thing up, then we've got to go from, if we want to double the speed, we're going to go to 120 hertz, okay? Now, if we're only adjusting it a little, we might only be at, you know, 48 hertz or 52 hertz, yeah. That's part of the reason, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not actually a, a clean, it's not getting a clean sine wave. Okay. There's a lot of noise there. And why is it so high pitched? Because that's the noise that's being introduced. Okay, is everyone okay to that point? Okay. Now... There are some benefits to having these VSDs, okay? Number one, energy saving. How does it help us save energy? Less power consumption. Yeah, you can use less power instead of having a big fat old control valve, just, you know, adding a heap of back pressure. Okay, we can save energy, right? Okay, it can improve our process control. The great thing about this thing is that can ramp up and down all day to keep a constant level, constant pressure, constant temperature, whatever your control variable is. They're a beautiful thing. Okay. The other thing, of course, is, is as you reduce speed, what happens to the reliability of equipment? Why does it go up? Currently should be lower, but yeah. It's not working. As you slow everything down, it's not working as hard. Now, if you leave it at fixed speed and you've just got a big fat old control valve shut full off, you've got actually more load and stress on the system, haven't you? Okay, you're going to have a lot more vibration as that flow's trying to get past that control valve. So yeah, as you get everything pulled back down, everything's going to last longer. It's, it's good for reliability, generally. There are a few problems, though. Do you know that when you introduce a VSD into a system, you introduce 12 additional modes of failure? Having just said that it was good for reliability? Can you see a bit of a, a paradox here? So you kind of have to be a little careful. Okay, number one though, is the minute you put that VSD in, from day one till day infinity, you are giving up somewhere between 25 and 5% of your power consumption continuously. Okay, how do I know that? I used to work for a company that built VSDs, and you want to know what my job was? I was responsible for dumping that power, because where did that power go? Heat. Okay, what drives that power? The higher this frequency, the bigger the losses. Because the losses are all generated here. The higher you switch those things, the bigger the losses. Okay? But in the grand scheme of things, that can be still a, be a penalty worth paying, right? Now, the other problem you can get is a mismatch of speeds, vein passes, that sort of thing, shaft excitation. As I've already mentioned, additional modes of failure. Um, has anyone fitted a VSD as a bit of a, an inside home job, if you like, at the plant? Sort of, you've got a a vendor supplied piece of kit and you've retrospectively come along and fitted a VSD? Has anyone done that? To a fan, compressor, pump? No? That's got a conservative bunch. Okay. A little word of warning. Very, very important that if you do it, you are very, very careful. Because without knowing, you could introduce the system where it's going to inadvertently get to a speed range that's going to suddenly hit a resonance somewhere and that thing will destroy itself in seconds. Okay, Variable speed kit that's supplied as a variable speed kit, say for example an air compressor, they've gone through and checked that it's got the right reinforcement in the right places to make sure you don't have problems. The early VST air compressors were speed windowed. The first thing they did is they just blacked out those speed bands. So the, v the first VST air compressors used to jump you know, from one band to the next to avoid those points. Um, not the smartest and smoothest way, but that was how they overcome it. Yes? I was just going to say that's what we've done. Yes. A few vibrations, we all know at a certain speed that that motor will start to shake and they just block that out. Yeah, okay. Just on a point. Yeah, okay. Not the most elegant solution, but hey, if that's what you got to do, you kind of just lump it, right? Okay. 
Now, this is what I want to cover very briefly today. There's quite a few electrical-based complications that come with this. Okay, you can introduce harmonics. Okay, the harmonics do what? Why are the harmonics bad? Sorry? Vibration. Um, these particular harmonics, not so much a vibration thing. Dirty power, and who, who slugs you with that? The power companies will slug you big time. What can happen is those harmonics actually propagate back down the distribution lines. Has anyone ever had a problem where you've had really dirty power and your TV sort of starts to lose reception and, and that sort of thing? Probably much more prevalent in sort of the third world now than, than sort of they've mostly gone on top of it with, with modern switch gear and, and whatnot, but it used to be a real problem sort of 10, 15 years ago. And that's that harmonics propagating back up the transmission line. In the same way, that harmonics goes downstream to your motor as well. And you know who was it that mentioned the, the, the whining and, and, and so on that happens? Okay. Um, who's heard of electrical discharge through bearings? Yeah. We just had on one of our brand new test scans. Okay. Is it a big problem? It was. It was? Okay. Change over somehow, grab it and filter. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're going to talk about that for a minute. Okay, here's the problem. 10, 15 years ago, VSDs were new technology. They were expensive. The company back when I was working, it was about sort of 16 years ago, and I was working for, for a company in New Zealand that made VSDs, they made an absolute fortune. It, it, the, the prices they charge make the 15000 look like a, a cheap... Uh, a cheap calculator, you know. Um, you know, they were expensive. And they could do it. Why? Because it was sort of new technology. Nowadays, VSDs are almost a commodity item. Would you agree? There's lots of cheap VSDs coming out of China. But just a little word of warning. You want to be very careful with the brand of VSD you use. A cheap VSD may be exactly that, a cheap VSD, and could cause you more problems. Okay? Um, what's a shortcut? A shortcut is a shorter path that is generally going to be more difficult, dangerous, and ultimately more costly than its alternative. Who would agree with that statement? It will be the shortest path between two points. Straight line generally is, unless that straight line is through some incredibly dense, thick jungle with deep ravines and and everything else which is impassable, okay, it might be safer to take the coastal route. Okay, so just a little cautionary note. Very important, now this has been mentioned numerous times this week, budgets, capital, okay. What's the first thing to get cut? Maintenance, okay, yeah. Well, we haven't even got to maintenance, we're still building the plant, okay. Someone comes along and says, look, in our budget, we've got, um, I'm currently uh, working with Fonterra New Zealand. We're building $500 million worth of uh, two powder plants, milk processing plants. They're going to be the biggest in the world. Okay, there's probably about $40 million worth of VSDs and motors in these plants. Okay. Now, what do you think if a contractor comes along and says, you know what, I reckon I can shave five million bucks off that bill if we go and get those motors over here. I can save another four million bucks if I go and buy our cable from this supplier over here. Okay, I can save another two million dollars if we buy this switch gear. And what's this? What's this line here with filters? We don't need filters. We can cut that out. That saves us another three million. Okay, suddenly that forty million dollar bill is now twenty, and the contractor's pocketing that twenty million bucks. Does that sound familiar? Does it happen? It does, right? How do we prevent that from happening? Specs, right? Yeah. Okay, so we've got real tight specs. Does that mean we've solved the problem? <laughs> Wouldn't you have to specify a particular manufacturer to be satisfied with it? Okay, is specifying enough? Okay. Key point. Isn't it, right? Okay, so you think you've written the specs, so problem solved, right? 
One of, one of the things I've seen time and time again in New Zealand, Australia, and other places around the world, company thinks because they've got a rock-solid, iron-clad specification that it's all good. On a big plant, 500 million bucks, that thing's still being designed. They poured the foundations three weeks ago. Okay, There's thousands of people crawling all over site, and the, the pressure's going to be on because the first tank a load of milk's going to arrive. Okay. What's the first thing that's going to be left off the list towards the end of the project? Commissioning. Conformance checks, right? Most important, guys, most important of all. You have your spec. You do all of this work to get all this sorted. But then time and time again, people don't follow through. Don't follow up. If you're the contractor, okay, you're thinking, hey, I can, I can save a few million bucks here. Are you going to chance your arm? knowing that more, more than likely they're not going to check? Or you're going to put a couple of the nice-looking gear on, you know, down low where they're going to look, and then sort of buried further into the plant, you know, sort of cut a few corners? Yeah, that's right. Hey, hey, I can, I can get my bonus, another million bucks. It happens. It really, really does. You've got to wise up to it and be prepared to say, hey, you know, you've, unfortunately, that is the way of the world. Okay, more and more stuff's being built in China. The most recent plant in New Zealand, they, they originally um, signed the contract to have a big chunk of it built in China based on the fact it was going to be cheaper. I um, had a follow-up meeting a couple of weeks ago, and you know what happened? The final result, 15% more expensive than it being built in New Zealand, Quality was rubbish. There was a huge amount of rework. A lot of it wasn't up to scratch and had to be redone anyway. Okay, so guess where the, the recent plant now being built is being built? It ain't being built in China. Okay. Now, no, no disrespect to our Chinese visitors here. I mean, this is, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it happens. You know, they came in with an offer and then the price got ratcheted up and ratcheted up. Okay, you have to be mindful of these things. Okay, as I mentioned, cabling to the VSD, absolutely important. What sort of cables need to be used? Does anyone know? Shielded cables. Shielded cables, yeah, okay. And you, you mentioned your VSD's got some nice filters on there to help the harmonics. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's what they're for. Okay, I want to talk for a minute about this discharge on the bearings. Where do you think this excess energy from all this harmonics goes? Where does it build up? On the rotor, right? Okay, so you've got to build up a voltage, a build up a potential. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now the problem is, is that's always going to be looking for a path to ground. Okay. What's the easiest path to ground? Wherever the shortest path is and generally through the bearings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we look at our bearing, inner race, bearing, outer race, what sort of gap have we got there? Okay, you know, when we, when we talk about electrical and, and getting an arc, what sort of separation distance for voltages are we talking about? Okay. Your high voltage lines, you know, if you've got 1 kV, how much separation do you need to have? Well, it's a fair bit. As you go up, you know, your high voltage lines, you've got a fair amount of separation, right, which is why you've got all of those, those insulators. As the voltage drops, okay, the, you know, the voltage is going to arc less and less and less, right? But how much voltage do we need to arc across 0.1 of a micron. Not a lot, right? 
Okay, and so this is how we get, see all those grooves there? What's that grooves? What's caused those grooves? That's an arc. So what you've actually got there, you've got a positive potential here. It's arced from here to the bearing, and then arced again. Because remember, how much are those clearances? I've exaggerated it right there. Okay. So how do we solve that problem? So we're going to uh, use grounded bearings, are we? Do we ground both bearings? What if we insulated the bearings? How about we insulate the bearings? It's still going to be looking for a path to ground, right? What happens if we ground both bearings? You've just created a loop, right? Okay, so what's the sensible solution here? Ground one bearing, or the shaft, okay, and insulate the other bearing. So you've got a single path to ground that you're controlling. Does that make sense? No? Yeah, okay. All right. Now, bear in mind, that's very much the band-aid. Because the ultimate thing we should be trying to do is limit the build-up of potential on the shaft in the first place, right? And how do we do that? The filters, okay? Why don't the filters get installed? Why don't filters get installed? Money, cost, right? Okay, so it's back to, hey, hang on, we've got to do this properly. You know, I'm going to talk in a minute with Steam about best practice. This is what best practice is really all about. It's how everyone else does it, how the contractor that got it the job because he, he bid the lowest price, how he's going to do it, versus the best practice maximum reliability solution, and that's doing the job properly, right? Okay. Okay, so I was going to go through some examples on using VSDs in terms of on compressors and everything else. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll want to move on to steam. Um, but what I will, do want to do is just a little pop quiz for you. I'm sure you're probably already aware of it, but as a quick review, is a VSD compressor, pump, or fan always the most effective option? Okay, why not? Okay. Okay, does anyone know as a rough guide what sort of load factor is sort of the cut on as to where the VSD is worthwhile. No? Sorry? Continuous duty? Um, well, there's a cut. What's the answer? It depends, right? Bit of a trick question, right? Okay. Okay. A VSD is not the eternal elixir or fix all solution. You've got to ask a couple of key questions, right? Number one, how much does the demand vary? Daily, seasonally, okay? Who mentioned that your, your grain elevators might be up and down and, you know, and so that the load could be varying, okay? Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is, can a fixed speed solution be employed? A pulley change, an impeller change on a pump or a fan, okay? maybe trimming the impeller. Now, as a general rule, and I don't think I've put this number up here, if your load, that's 
If it's between 80, maybe 85% to 100, guarantee you'll be better off without a VSD and just have a control valve. Be more efficient, less modes of failure to your system. Below 80% and you start to get into a VSD territory, assuming, of course, that your demand is still doing this. If your demand is like that, what do you think? Resize it, right? If, if you've got 15, 20% variation max, you don't need a VSD. Okay, it's, it's a matter of sizing. Why do a lot of people throw a VSD on a system and a cheap one at that? It's because the design engineer doesn't know how big to make it. So what does he do? Goes an extra size, throws the VSD on and says, that's all right, we'll just tune it on commissioning and leave it. I've seen so many VSD-driven pieces of equipment, the VSD's been just set from the day it was commissioned as run continuously that, at that speed from then on. You're just burning 3% for nothing, plus you've got an additional asset that you've got to then keep a spare for, okay? And additional failure modes. So what's the sensible thing to do? Get a pulley change to match the speed and use your control valve. But in our case, we use so much uh, process, so they were from sometimes 10 hertz, and it was up to 60 hertz. Okay, so in that case, you're going to use the VSD, right? Okay, but if you're going to use the VSD, you need to do it properly and have some filters. equipment very quickly if you don't do it right. There you go. Yeah. That's it right there. Now yeah, and, and what was that what was the expense of that? The total cost of the repair rebuild. Right? So we got to get that thing what our down we probably lost about eight or nine million. Eight or nine million. Did they cover that part under warranty? So who really carries the risk? Does your warranty cover you at the end of the day? It's your business carrying the risk. And what if that extra risk is the, 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 the final straw that breaks the camel's back and that's it, the business sets up shop? You know, I can tell you right now, you could, a couple of sets of filters might set you back 300,000, right? Some, some proper insulation and grounded, grounding on the bearings. You know, you could spend 500000 to do that right, okay? What's the payback to avoid another eight, nine million dollar loss, right? Okay, so a little take home message guys, a job done right is a job done once. And it applies to this more than ever, okay? VSDs can be a powerful solution if you've got the correct installation, good harmonic filters, correct bearing management, and good system control. Okay, but remember, key point before you worry about any of that, what's my demand profile? Do I even need to add a VSD? Okay, do I have any questions from any of you before we move on? Yeah? What is the relation between the torque and the speed? Well, and very good question, and this is one of the, the, the special reasons my, you want, my, why you might want to use a VSD, because one of the advantages of a VSD is you can generate whatever torque you need at whatever speed you need it at, whereas with a motor run direct online, your, your torque's a direct function of the slip based on, 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 on load and speed and all the rest of it. So 
So yeah, exactly right. If you've got a specialty application where you need, in particular at low speed, high torque requirements, then that's where a VSD does come into its own. So very good question, very good point. There are other reasons why you might, might, why you might need a VSD. Um, we'll go behind you, Drew, first. What's the typical cost of a VFD compared to the cost of a, another piece of equipment that could run in the range that you need it to run? Um, yeah, good question. Typically, um, 10, 15 years ago, um, the second piece of equipment was probably the cheaper option. Um, nowadays, the VSD is typically the cheaper option. But what you've got to be careful of, though, is that's probably before you build in the extra costs of doing it right. And it's probably line ball. But what I'd say is this. Typically speaking, the advantages you get from in terms of process control and, and, and management of your process and stability of your process of just having the one asset or one piece of equipment, be it a pump, fan, being able to move continuously with your process as opposed to having the upset of bringing a second pump or, or whatever on. Um, so generally speaking, my recommendation would be to, to, to go with the variable speed option rather than try and... I, I refer to that as the poor man's VSD. And, and to, to give you a really good example, you consider you could have a, a 300 kilowatt variable speed air compressor or you could have 10... 30 kilowatt fixed speed compressors, okay? And you could set them all up on a pressure cascade control and you could have effectively what I would refer to as a poor man's VSD air compressor. But in terms of operation stability and, and, and then in terms of maintenance, you're maintaining one piece of equipment instead of having multiple. So yeah, so I think even the immediate capital cost might be line ball, but if you take a step further back, and look at the big picture in terms of life cycle cost, stability of control, I, I would go with the, the variable speed controlled option every time. You have, yeah? Great question. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Hey James, we've got a lot of people that are looking at replacing their air compressors. They've got a modulating compressor sitting in now. Yes. Companies are coming in and doing their air audits, compressed air audits, and they're recommending that they take out a 100-horse, a maybe have a 100-horse or maybe even two 100-horse modulating compressors, replacing one with a variable speed drive compressor that's probably a 100-horse that, you know, maybe the 100-horse would carry the whole load. So what you're saying is... Uh, in, Instead of going that that complete replacement, it'd almost be better just to stay with what they have rather than 80 to 100 percent loaded than to go the variable speed drive. Great, great question. Um, let me just draw you a quick picture on this. It all depends. what your air compressor load's doing. And I, I'm not aware of too many compressed air systems, to be honest, that do this. Most compressed air systems actually are sort of a little bit more like that, right? Now, um, this is probably a conversation for another day, and I'm happy to to sort of at another time tomorrow or whenever to, to go into a bit more detail. But, um, but, but yeah, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I will say this, my, my pet hate on this sort of work being done, a lot of people come in, as I call them, the super slick salesmen. They, they might put a little logger box on, log a few amps, and then sort of suddenly, hey, presto, well, oh, that lines up with this shiny gray box or blue box or green box or pink box, depending on which company they represent. Okay, and, and this is our magic option, and I'll save you 35% um, is, is the classic sort of marketing phrase. It all depends on what your true profile is, and the only way you're going to get that is if you actually measure it. And when I say measure it, I'm not talking about measuring amps at the compressor. I'm talking about measuring flow, measuring pressure, and understanding where you're at. But see, even before you do that, 
It's a question of how much of your compressed area you're actually using for what it needs to be used and how much is waste because the first thing to do is fix all the waste and then think about what you actually need in terms of the size of the compressor. There's a whole process there where half the industry is doing it the wrong way around and, and, and still are, frankly. Um, but happy to have that conversation um, um, during a break or whatever. I'll be here till right through till Friday. So, if, is that okay? I, I could talk for a couple of hours just on that. So. Uh.